Hello, everyone, and welcome to Film Independent Presents, our now virtual screening series, uh, along with live Q&As. We are so happy to be joined today by the City Surreal team, uh, director, producer, cinematographer, and editor, Steve James, and producer, sound recordist, Zach Piper. Uh, we also have a guest moderator today, Ben Travers, the deputy editor of IndieWire, which we're so happy to welcome. Just before we get started, I want to thank a few of our partners. Uh, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, our lead sponsor, uh, without whose support this program would not be possible. Uh, the HFPA has been, a, been an ardent supporter of this program for many years, and we are so thankful for their support. Also to our media partner, the Los Angeles Times, and to our screening partner, Vision Media. And of course, special thanks to Nat Geo for bringing this to us. Uh, if you have any questions for our panelists, there is a Q&A button near the bottom. Um, feel free to bring that up and type it in and hopefully we can get towards it towards the end of the Q&A. Uh, and before we, before this goes on way too long, uh, I will pass it over to Ben. Uh, Brian, thank you for that introduction. That was great. Um, Zach, Steve, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I am so excited to talk about this show. I've been dying to talk about it since uh, I saw it at Sundance this year and obviously a lot has changed th since then, which we'll get into. Um, but first and foremost, uh, to just start at the very basics, uh, did this project begin when you saw the emerging field of 21 mayoral candidates or had it kind of originated even before that? Well, <clears throat> I, it's something that I'd wanted to do for years, um, having been in Chicago all these years uh, and thought about trying to do it at different other different junctures, like when Obama was running for president. Uh, but this seemed like the perfect time when this rolled around, I said to Zach, like, I think this is the time to go do this because this is going to be the most wide open mayoral race in maybe history. And I think it was. Um, and we knew that the, the, um, the trial of Jason Van Dyke, the white police officer for the murder of Laquan McDonald was going to happen smack in the middle of it. And we just thought, well, this is Chicago at a crossroads now. This would be a great time to try to do it. And the thing we didn't anticipate was Rahm Emanuel dropping out, um, which really blew it wide open, you know, in terms of people entering the field. He did us a favor because I don't think he was going to let us film no. him. So, yeah, and that was that was one of my biggest questions, too. I mean, obviously, it's it's a massive field. There are only so many people that you have at your disposal to kind of, you know, be with everybody at the different campaign stops and different moments. Um, how did you kind of winnow it down to the people you wanted to talk to? Like, how did you uh, end up focusing on the subjects that you chose? Because obviously it's not all 21, but you do get to a wide spread of the candidates. Yeah, we spared you all 21 and, and, our, and ourselves. Um, you know, yeah, we knew that there would be, that would be impossible. And so what governed our choices were essentially two things, I think. One was um, we, we did want to try and follow a diverse group of candidates because the field was diverse. So that was important to us. Uh, secondly, we wanted, to, um, we wanted to make sure if we could, that we could follow some of the people who would be perceived as front runners just in case they won. And the, the, what was interesting about that was that none of the front runners you know, wanted to let us follow them because they, you know, they would see us with the camera and they would think we were the everyday media and they'd be like, oh, hey, you know, their press people were very friendly. And then as soon as we explained what we were doing, it was like, no, thank you. Um, because, you know, if, if they won, they worried that there might be something embarrassing in the content is basically what, and we weren't going to help them get elected. So as a result of that, we ended up, and, and this was maybe a third thing that was important to us, we wanted to focus on candidates that just interested us, that people, we, whether they had a shot at winning or not, we wanted to follow candidates that we thought had something to say or were different or unusual. And so the ones we landed on were kind of the all-star group of candidates that, that we ended up really wanting to follow. And I guess, Zach, were there, were there moments kind of early on when you were out in the field and following certain people that stood out to you like, okay, this is, this is a signifier, or this is a moment, or this is something about the candidate that like, you know, obviously there's more here. Like, obviously this is going to make for a, a, a kind of a good subject. Yeah, I think with, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is with Amara Inya, who is, you know, featured throughout the series and just seeing 
um, the organization she had within her campaign, but how it was really appealing to younger voters. You know, she was really sort of, you know, she wasn't the only uh, millennial candidate, but she was really appealing uh, to those folks. And I, you know, I think that was a real standout um, for her. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, also you know, someone who was interesting, but who wasn't really in the mix as much was Neil Silas Griffin, who also is someone we feature throughout the, the series. Um, but he he didn't really run much, really a, a much of a campaign in, in the sense, in the same way that other candidates did. But, um, you know, we really got to know him a great deal at the Board of Elections, where his amazing attitude and his tenacity in this <laughs> process of petition challenges and, you know, going through every signature and address. Um, and he always did it with a smile. Um, and he stuck it out through the whole process, and which I thought was pretty amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, we kind of love the fact that one of the most significant candidates in our series came in last place. Mm -hmm. um, and, and not because he was a joke. You know, he's, he's an amazing guy. He's a truly amazing individual. And of course, then there was Willie Wilson, who was a gift from the doc gods. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> it's how could we not follow Willie if Willie would let us? Well, and uh, with, with Willie, Actually, before we move on from Neil, I wanted to ask kind of a, a, a detailed question or, or just a, a little thing. Um, there's that shot early on of his apartment and the wall in his apartment that has the neighborhoods kind of blocked out in the colors. And then as the series progresses, you know, you use the map with the color uh, kind of to symbolize where we are in that. Did you, I mean, obviously the neighborhoods are well-defined already, but did you use that? Was that the inspiration to put it on screen or was that just a convenient way to kind of show how you were gonna do things from the start? Hmm. That's a good question. You know, I don't think it was, was yeah. it? I don't think it, I, I think, think so. I feel like that the neighborhood depiction of Chicago is something, it's sort of out there. There's a number of artists that kind of, you know, do things with that. Yeah, we probably ripped it off from somebody, but I don't think it was from Will, from from Neil, <laughs> I guess. Well, I love that. I love that map in like on his wall. And it was just such a great yeah. moment of detail. It's so um, classic. It's so classic for a guy in Chicago to have that map on his wall, <laughs> painted on his wall. As, as an Illinois person who's drawn maps on his own walls before, that was very uh, <laughs> identifiable for me. Um, but to go to to go to Willie, I want that's a that's a perfect person to be to ask the question of how did you frame your pitch? Like you talked about it a little bit before in terms of like we're not here, like we're not going to help your campaign because this is going to come out afterward. Uh, you know, we we might have footage of you that's behind the scenes that you know we're going to keep we're going to have access to like you don't get to you know have a final say so what was kind of a pitch especially for somebody like willie to be like hey we want to be around and you want to let us be around no no that's a great question and you know a person who on our team who was vitally important to getting his cooperation was field producer Silvetta christmas um she started working willie uh and his um his his press guy his right hand man scott and then Zach, Zach kind of closed the deal. <laughs> um, he, I don't know, somehow Zach, you should pick it up because you, you and Scott kind of bonded a, a, on a shoot or something, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, the, I think the pitch was just, you know, kind of what you see the series is. It's a, a portrait of the city where we're following a number of candidates, but we're not really following, you know, we didn't want to just follow his campaign. Uh, and we didn't need, you know, all, all around access, we just needed, to be in the loop on what they were up to and to have the option to film or not film. Um, it, it's interesting, I still get uh, text messages from, he's now, Willie Wilson's now running for US Senate and I still get text messages, um, you know, about what they're up to. Uh, but that, that was just, they were, they were fantastic uh, in keeping us in the loop. And, you know, when we, there, there's a scene uh, later in the series where we, we follow um, Willie, going to, from church to church on a Sunday morning. And, you know, that was, there was a great uh, collaboration in organizing that and making sure that we didn't get lost on the highway or when you know, we're following the car and all that sort of things. So, yeah, I think they liked us. And I think yeah, Willie, yeah. and I think Willie likes the attention, you know, um, like any good candidate. Um, and I think, I think, I, and I think, and I could be wrong, uh, Zach, tell me if I got this wrong in your view. But I think Willie thought he was going to win. Mm. And I think he saw us following him as capturing history in the making. 
you know, that, mm-hmm. that this was something that should be captured because he's going to win. Yeah, which I also I, think it's, I love that thinking. I love that thinking. <laughs> yeah, helpful. But I also think it's something like, you know, you're going to go do a campaign stop. And if you have a camera crew following you, well, it looks all the more important, all the more, you yeah. know, it's like people look and say, oh, wait, well, who are they filming? Oh, it's it's this candidate. Let me walk over and see it. Just sort of like raises the visibility. Somehow. Well, and, and one of the reasons Paul Vallis is not a good candidate, the, the white uh, candidate, the wonky white candidate that we follow, um, it, one of the reasons he was a, a failed candidate for mayor, I think, is because um, <laughs> he, he, they let us in. We filmed quite a bit with them, but he never wanted to have us film him in the field because he thought it was going to, I mean, or have, it, have us be identified as filming him mm-hmm. um, because he didn't want people to think he had this big ego and had a film crew following around. And, mm-hmm. and you know, Phil, his, his guy that you get to know in the series, who's very funny, the guy who's trying to get everybody at, the, at Daly's restaurant to, to talk to him, Phil was kind of like, dude, but, but, you know, kind of what Zach was saying, it's like, that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> people like that, you yeah. know. But well, you know, off of what you're saying at that, that Daly's restaurant scene, it's like that, that challenge, you know, is what really kind of opened the idea of, well, we can't, we kind of negotiate and say, well, let us come, let us film yeah. the event at the restaurant. We'll keep our distance. And the way we could keep our distance was to put a, a lav mic on Phil, who is the primary, and then also the, the, the waitress. So we would just get audio as maybe they would walk by, but we would keep our distance and not interfere with the conversation. Um, and it turned into something much greater of a scene than, than what Yeah, it's a doing. much better scene than if yeah. we had been sitting at the table listening to him talk wonky policy to people. <laughs> I know people are watching this, maybe you haven't seen that episode. That's, I mean, that scene, because that's in episode three, but you know, maybe that's a reason to keep watching. Yeah, no, you, you painted it very well. And it is something of one of those moments where you're kind of, you kind of get to watch the inner workings of a campaign and just kind of seeing what they're doing on the day-to-day uh, to try to, you know, gain traction and, and you know, put people on the pavement and, and you know, make a compelling case to the, to the voters. Um, and I was curious, just kind of, I mean, it, it seems like when there are, you know, big press conferences or city hall meetings or uh, kind of events on the calendar, like you guys would know where you had to be, or at least know that you needed somebody there to cover that. But kind of on those daily grinds where, uh, you know, there's nothing huge or something that stands out, how did you kind of set your schedule and decide like, okay, this is going to be a good opportunity or this is going to be a good opportunity. Are you just constantly in contact with a lot of them to see what they're doing that day and see who's available? Like how does that organization standpoint kind of work out? That's right. right. And, yeah. We, you know, oftentimes we would know of, of let's say like a press conference at city hall at 8 AM and we'd go to that, we'd film, but we'd not have anything else planned for the day. And we would just, you know, kind of feel out, what was happening at the press conferences, you know, is, is the candidate or the campaign or whatever, are they going to do something else that's of interest? And if that wasn't the case or we weren't, you know, we were, didn't have access to whatever they were doing, we would start calling folks. Um, uh, we would call folks, see what they're up to, candidates or people follow up with, you know, whoever we, we intended to film with but hadn't quite yet. Um, we search social, social media to see what might be up, you know, what might be happening. Um, and sometimes we would just go somewhere to eat and sit down and talk and, you know, um, sort of figure it out and, and sometimes bump into people and, and. Yeah, that's the other thing is, is that, and, you know, we try to preserve that in the way this is put together. Um, we also weren't confined by the, the uh, campaigns and what was going on with them. There were many days where we might shoot something that's related to the mayoral race in the morning. And then we would, we would get caught up with somebody that's really interesting to us, you know, and, and, and we would just go do that. And it, and we didn't want this, this series to be completely consumed by the mayoral election and not be able to go off on those tangents like the dog walker mm-hmm. or the shoe shine guy. Um, you know, those were people we, you know, the dog walker was someone, my son, who who was one of the DPs on this, 
recommended and that was such a great idea um, but a lot of times we we just stumbled across people and they just suddenly became characters in our in our series and a great example of, of that is when we were finished with the day of shooting and i open up the my phone lift app to get you know someone to pick us up to take us back to our cars and we ended up filming with the lift driver and it's an important scene um in episode four i think yeah you know and yeah. that was just complete happenstance i mean we just that was our lift driver she um, was great she was and and she, bringing her back again like in episode five too was like such an essential mm -hmm. voice for that part of the conversation um and to kind of uh i guess steer things into that direction i mean so many of the topics covered in those initial four episodes that again you shot during you know 2018 and a little bit into 2019 um so many of those became a part of the national conversation in 2020 in such a big way from widespread issues like defunding the police to specific people like Kanye West getting involved in, in political mm -hmm. campaigns. Um, what was it like for you to watch that happening in 2020? Obviously you went out to start shooting again for, for additional footage and, and eventually became episode five, but just as, that, as those topics started to become you know, more prevalent across the country, uh, what was going through your mind? Like, what was it like to kind of watch those get more attention? Well, uh, speaking for myself, uh, at first, because the pandemic kind of shut, you know, everything down, including sales uh, of, you know, we hadn't sold the series yet when the pandemic hit and, uh, and everything was kind of ground to a halt. And, you know, honestly, we were a little worried. <laughs> and, and I remember thinking when all this was going on, like this series has so much to say before we even went out to do episode five, this series has so much to say about what's going on in this country. It's, it's not just a story of Chicago. Hmm. Um, and I believe that to this day, but when, when, the, when the pandemic hit, we started thinking, boy, we should, we should maybe do some kind of postscript um, because we worried, even though we don't agree with this, we worried that people might be tempted to look at the series and think that's ancient history. That's not the world I'm living in now. Um, and so we thought, well, we better get out and get a little something for the pandemic. And so we went out with this idea we were going to do something maybe 15, 20 minutes long. Mm -hmm. And then in classic Steve fashion, um, when George Floyd hit, we ended up making a, an 82 minute episode. <laughs> so, but, you know, it, I'm so glad we did it. It was, it was, it was a challenge, but I'm so glad we did it because I think it really does it makes it inescapable for people watching this series to not get the ways in which what goes on in Chicago or what goes on in America. Yeah. And, and it's true to your point, Ben, you know, the first four episodes, all of the issues that were, you know, that are front and center right now in this, in our, in this country, you know, it's like, they're all in episodes one through four and it's just episode five, this 2020 is sort of like a crystallization of everything. Um, and it kind of all comes to this point. Yeah, I, I mean, again, just from like a, a kind of a small technical standpoint, I, again, I, I got to watch these for, for the Sundance Film Festival, you know, nine months ago, and I watched them again, you know, this week to, you know, prepare for this and also talk about it when, when the series comes out uh, well, tonight. But We will send you a plaque for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, believe me, the series itself was gift enough, um, but I, I didn't notice any changes. Like, I don't, I didn't, I, my memory could be very faulty and, and obviously it is, but it really felt like you didn't have to change anything from those episodes that you'd already made mm -hmm. to kind of mesh those messages and, and what was happening then with what was going on now. It really does feel like a pretty effortless transition, even though you're jumping ahead a year in, in the timeline. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very nice of you to say. Uh, you know, we thought we were gonna have to make some changes. We, we thought with Nat Geo, once Nat Geo entered the picture, that we were gonna have to make trims and changes just mm -hmm. to accommodate a broadcast hour. Um, we were very pleased to hear from them that they were like, nope, we, we, we love it the way it is. And, and, and we, we mm -hmm. felt kind of like you did that it, it didn't need to be changed. Mm -hmm. And the other piece of it was we had our hands full with episode five, mm -hmm. that the, the idea that we weren't gonna have to make changes to those first four and we felt good about them was such a relief to us because then we could throw all our focus entirely on episode five. 
Okay, well, let's 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 dig into episode five a little bit. Um, again, like it's it's something that I know that like people watching right now haven't seen, but um, like there's a lot of questions about kind of the production of it and and the timeline and everything that I think would be very interesting for people, especially who are you know uh, interested in independent film and how it, how it gets done. Um, so to start with, from a production standpoint, I mean, how many people do you have in the field at a given time? Like, uh, and, and did it change from those first four episodes to the fifth episode? Like, how many people do you have out shooting on one day, typically? Uh, typically, there's two, me and Zach, or yeah. Zach and my son, or, or, or we had other people who did play significant but smaller roles in the production, like Kevin Shaw and Bailey Martin. Um, but this was, this may look like we had people fanning out all over the city, but it's not, you know, it's not how it got made because this started out as a film, a standalone film and mushroomed into a docu-series and we needed for budget reasons alone, if we were gonna get our way with that, we needed to do it as economically as possible. And that meant <laughs> me and Zach a lot. Um, like I wasn't going to shoot as much as I ended up shooting originally, but that's what that's the way it evolved. And um, and we love it. I mean, we love being out. And and then on election day, and Zach can tell you about this. Election day was a whole different animal. Zach, yeah. election day because that. because we because we had so many candidates to follow and so many areas we wanted to to cover, um, including uh, a crew you know, from, I think about whenever the polls opened at 6 a.m. until the election, the results were in at nine o'clock at night, uh, a crew at the Board of Elections. But the point is that we ended up having seven crews that day. Um, <laughs> and over the course of election day in 2019, we, something over 30 hours of footage between the crews. Um, we, we designed it so that Steve could hit each primary candidate that we've been following at least once. Um, but we, we deployed a full three person uh, crew times seven um, all around the city to, you know, some folks were just going to polling places. Like there's a scene, uh, a little moment where they're opening a polling place in a laundromat. And that was a crew that was going around just to polling places to get, you know, some flavor of what was happening that morning. It, it was a gas though that day. I mean, it was crazy, yeah. but it was a gas it was. because we had people out getting all this great stuff and and i was able to be yeah i was able to be like a utility fielder or something you know i could i i go i go shoot a little bit with willie and then i go shoot a little bit with amara and then you know with neil and and it was you know it was just a lot of fun it was well uh with with that very much in mind how did things change in terms of your shooting procedures when you had to shoot during the pandemic? Because obviously there's been a lot of talk within the industry about you know uh, different guidelines being set and different ways to start back up for production and safe ways to shoot things. But you're doing this very early on and you're doing this independently you know, for the most part. So like, what did you put into practice to try to protect yourselves while you're out in the field? Well, we didn't do it lightly, um, that's for sure. Uh, we, in fact, you know, the early on in, in April when we started filming um, episode five, it was all over Zoom. And I think the very first shoot that we went out was at the very end of April. Uh, we filmed a scene that's not actually in the episode. Um, and we went out very sparingly thereafter. You know, we always were practicing, you know, being as safe as we possibly could, keeping our distance, you know, not always uh, micing people up, or if we were, we were, you know, having them mic themselves up. Um, you know, gloves, masks, tons of hand sanitizer, distance. Um, and, and then we also uh, were tested occasionally. In fact, we, we filmed, there's a scene in, in episode five where someone, um, uh, a, an older, older woman uh, in Chicago is, is being tested. Well, Steve, Steve was tested at the same moment. We just didn't show that in the film. And I had been tested the day before, so I, I didn't want to take another one up. Yeah, Steve, a lot of you made it into that final episode from those Zoom calls where your face is in the in the corner to like the the, the uh, frame of your desktop for a second desktop, to yeah. like the reversal in the barber shop when you know they're talking about your hair and how long it's been. <laughs> yeah, uh, so yeah, you're you're very much out in the field. You're very much out doing it. It was it was impressive. 
Yeah, I, I wanted to be all over this episode, you know, as much as I could. Uh, and I wanted people to see my really screwed up desktop with all those files. Yeah. <laughs> so you finally got that haircut, Steve. I did. I got a haircut. Nice. <laughs> well, the, the desktop certainly put me at ease for, for what mine looks like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, before we before we kind of segue into some of the audience questions, because I see that we've got a few over there, I wanted to ask a little bit about again, like you, the the idea for getting that that fifth episode out there seemed you know great and very clear and very purposeful, and it, it works beautifully. Um, but I wanted to ask a little bit about the timing of the release. Like, how did it? I mean, I know you you partnered with Nat Geo, um, and that's very exciting. So they have a obviously a big say in in how it comes out when it comes out. Was it important to you to be coming out before the election, and and why, if that was the case? Well, that you know that was their idea um, when when they were um, you know about to make an offer on it, or even right right around when they made the offer, they said, "This is what we'd love to do, and we'd love to have all five episodes." And is that possible? That that was like a question. Like, is that? And they they were clear, like it wasn't like if we said no, we can't do that, then they're like, okay, well, deals off at all, not at all. Mm -hmm. But they really wanted that. And we love that, or I love that idea. I think you did too, right, Zach? It's like right. we love the idea of it coming out around the election. And if it could come out right before the election, we love that even more because we feel like it has, you know, it has so much. And this was this was before we really knew the extent of the George Floyd situation, right? The 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 full extent of that. No, no, that's not true. We knew. We knew. No, we had been filming. Never that's wrong. Um, but but we we just we just love the whole idea of it. And we love the idea that that they have also decided to do this voting um PSA campaign around the series, which you know will give people a chance to go to the bathroom, which is you know always good. Um, at the top of the hour, but also kind of be encouraged to uh, to get out there and vote if they haven't voted yet. So we we loved it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, for I guess for both of you, um, I think like you said, there there's so many parallels uh, between what's going on in Chicago and what's going on in America. There's so many people who you can individually identify with. There's so many um, Kind of challenges and conflicts that you know that are brought up by the show that you you know you want to talk about it it makes you want to get engaged and, and try to improve or fix or, or even just you know have a conversation with people around you to, to try to better understand what's going on um from your end when when they watch the series when they get through those five episodes is there anything in particular you hope that they're left with whether it's kind of a, a better picture of chicago itself to you know a a, a a message at the end of one of the episodes or a certain person that they could have, you know, that, that really would, you'd really like people to remember or, or to stand out. Um, just for either of you, is there anything in your mind that, that kind of is is top of mind or you want to be top of mind for everybody else? Zach, do you want to go first or do you want me to? You can go first. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's a big, uh, it's a big question. I no, apologize. It's a big one. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think, you know, when you make something like this, you want people to take a lot away, right? Uh, you, you want them and remember more than one person, um, of course. But um, you know, I, I think for me, it, it you, you know, the thing I probably want most is for people to realize that Chicago is not the way it's been painted hmm. uh, in the national media and by our president, uh, in particular. Um, it, yes, Chicago has serious issues, like a lot of places, and it has serious issues with violence. <clears throat> There's no question. But it, it's also an incredibly beautiful city, and, and, and we're not just talking about the skyline. And it's got incredible people who are <laughs> so passionate about this place and about this world that we live in. And hmm. so I, I, you know, I hope that people when they see this series, they feel like what they're getting is an unvarnished street level view of this city, but that they also come away going, you know what? That's a pretty awesome place, that's Chicago. Mm -hmm. I should have gone first because that's what I was sort of thinking I was trying to formulate the thought, but I, I, you know you, what? I gave I will, you a chance, I gave you a chance. I will, you did, you did. I will add, I'll, I'll add on to that then just a little bit, which is just that, um, I mean, you, you sort of said it, Steve, but not letting not letting the 
the reputation, the, the sort of negative aspects of, you know, how Chicago is portrayed outside of Chicago, not letting that define, you know, who, what Chicago is and, and all the very, all the stories and all the characters and all the, you know, um, all, all the people that, that are here, very passionate people. And, and maybe, you know, um, it, it shakes up people's um, opinion of the city. And, and maybe that can be applied to other, other things too, where, where people, you know, sort of define things by reputation or by, you know, um, where you're not looking at a complete picture and you're kind of shorthanding it and moving on. And, and maybe, maybe we can shake up people's um, perception of the city and maybe, yeah, that can, that can be applied beyond. Yeah, like, like to their own cities, you know, right. like, like what's going on in your city and how does that relate? Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's funny when we were first trying to um, interest buyers in this out of Sundance, a number of them said, oh, well, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of regional. Yeah, it's about Chicago. And, and a, a friend of mine said it best when I was complaining about that. They said, well, why don't you tell them that every film is set somewhere? Yeah, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> which that's a which, great that's a great retort. It's like that's kind of true. Um, and and that thank God, I mean the Nat Geo folks totally got this. When they saw it, they didn't see it that way at all. They saw it and they were like, um, well, of course this is about America. You know, yes, it's about Chicago, and Chicago is an amazingly interesting, unique, wonderful place. But it's also about America, and I think you know that's that's reason enough. I think for people to watch this, even if you think you you're not curious about Chicago, you will be when you watch it. But but I you know it, it's about America. Yeah, there's there's so many textures and and um, individuals that stand out within this that are so easily identifiable. I'd I'd be stunned if everybody couldn't find a bunch of things to grasp onto when they watch it, uh, let alone watch it a few times, which is uh, very, very rewarding. So uh, let's jump into the Q&A. I know we've got a few uh, sitting here. Um, first and foremost, I think we talked about this a little bit, but Jonathan wanted to know, um, how has the film been used as a tool to help people get out the vote in the 2020 election? So obviously Nat Geo is running that, um, uh, that kind of PSA to kind of you know, help with that cause. But is it being screened places, or or uh, are there other ways that that you guys have tried to engage to to just get people interested in voting and interested in in the campaign itself? No, and and I'm not really I'm not really fully equipped to answer all the ways in which that manifests itself. But but they but I know that Nat Geo is is plugged into this campaign that has, I believe, that kind of engagement. And it's not like they're showing the series, but it's plugging into this ongoing effort. To get people to vote. The other thing, the other thing they're doing is, is that they're getting it out to educators, mm -hmm. um, and they've they've made real inroads in terms of getting it to educators uh, so that students can watch this mm -hmm. and and have real conversations. There's a whole study guide and all this kind of great stuff going on with it. So. And that's already underway too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember they did that with America to me as well, which I thought was such a, a great idea uh, when oh that. Oh my came god! Out. Yeah. Uh, really help people connect with it. So that's that's exciting, that's great. Um, next question up, uh, this one's from an anonymous uh, attendee. Uh, can you discuss kind of how you were able to turn the series around so quickly and what you did to first assemble your team? Like, again, we talked a little bit about at the start kind of, you know, who was involved with this and how many people you had, but um, the turnaround time had to be very tight. Uh, I mean, one for the Sundance deadline early in the year, two to get that fifth episode in on time. So could you talk a little bit about that process and, and probably how it changed when you had to edit from home, if it changed at all, when you had to isolate? Well, I edit from home always. I, um, the pandemic hasn't changed my life much, except when I venture out because I work from home and I love to edit from home. Um, you know, we we just we work with people that we've worked with before um, when we can. Uh, the you know Zach and I have worked together now very closely for twelve years, I think, uh, or so. Um, and so he's you know he's like one of the best. He's probably the best documentary producer in Chicago, in my humble opinion. And he is and he is without question the best doc. Verite doc sound guy in Chicago. And that's something we've pioneered here at Cartemquin in Chicago, the producer sound guy, 
Um, I don't think anybody does that anywhere else, but but there's there's a few of them here um, because it's just I don't know it just seems to work. But um, but we also work with people from America to Me, like Kevin Shaw, who was one of the directors on America to Me and who did some shooting. My son, as I mentioned before, the field producers. One of the field producers was from America to Me. So we just work with people who are really really good. Jania Smith is her name. Um, but we work small. And then of course, in editing, we had a tremendous team. You know, we, we had a tremendous team of, of both uh, assistant editors, but also among those, the, the editing support team, we had people actually cutting scenes because they were some of the people that worked with us on America to me. And they, they were engaged. There were at least three individuals that were actually out there, you know, in their cutting scenes for myself and for David Simpson, my co-editor, the primary editors. Um, and they do, you know, they did great work. And then David Simpson is probably, you know, he's the most talented doc editor I know uh, and, and certainly have worked with. And he and I have a long history now too. So I don't know, I, I think when you have a team that's used to working with each other and they're very productive and they're very creative people you know, you can turn things around quicker, <laughs> or 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 you have to. <laughs> yeah, we, we only have six weeks to make an episode, an eighty-two minute, basically a feature. That's what yeah, we, no, that that, that fifth yeah. one was long, and that that was a, that was a huge question when I was watching. I was like, again, this is a lot of footage, and it's a it's a lengthy episode, but that doesn't make the editing process any easier. So, uh, yeah, that was impressive. Um, all right, so I think two of these might be able to kind of tie together. Uh, but one of the questions, again, from an anonymous attendee was, um, how did you two, how did you both grow as filmmakers during this experience while shooting this? And um, are there three things or, or something kind of top of mind that you'll take away from the project and, and hopefully apply to your next one? Hmm. Good, Zach. You know, this was such a unique project. You know, it, it's like, it was familiar in the verite aspect of it, but in how we, the, the Saren, Dipity and the, you know, the sort of open-minded nature in which we were out and um, every day. I, I think for me that that is something that's gonna that's gonna stick and, and last. Um, it was an experience like no other, and you know, it, it, to be honest, it took some months to get in the groove of that for sure. Um, but once we got into it. Now it feels like, how are we going to get out of the groove of this? <laughs> you know, like, I don't want to go back to the other way. I like this way. Um, and, and so I, that's a huge takeaway for me personally or professionally. Yeah, I, I mean, I should have gone first because I was going to say that one. But, but it's so true. It's like embedded in this idea of how we were going to do this. Well, it, well this film was inspired uh, for me by Chris Marker's Le Jolie Mai. Um, I saw it way back in grad school. Uh, it was one of those films that made me think documentary may be the kind of films I want to make because it was so free flowing and he kind of throws everything at that film stylistically that you can imagine to tell the story. It's like, it's no holds barred. And, and so I knew that when we when we were going to attempt to do our version <laughs> of a Chris Marker film, which is a little scary, um, that we were going to try to adopt the same kind of freedom of approach and and really count on things to lead us to other things. The black barber shop led us to the white barber shop, um, and and then we cut them next to each other because we really liked the contrast of that. And so yeah, it was. You know, the Maisels, I've always, one of the things I've always loved about the Maisels work, um, which, you know, people talk about the Maisels and, 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 and they talk about Frederick Wiseman and Wiseman is that fly on the wall approach, you know, par excellence. Mm -hmm. uh, the Maisels do that too, but they also engage with people frequently. Some of their best work, they're, you know, like Grey Gardens, they're engaging with, with subjects and I always love that about their work. And I, it's something that I love. It's just kind of the way I am. I like engaging with people in the field. And this was a film where we had complete freedom and permission to do that and, and even make it part of the filmmaking process. And I, I, I really love that. I don't feel like I have to do that every time, mm -hmm. don't worry. But this was one where it felt like the right choice and that your cat's there. 
I said. Yeah, yes, she <laughs> heard your explanation and was like, I've got to be a part of this now. <laughs> um, but no, I, I think uh, the, the follow-up that I wanted to ask to that, which was another audience question, was just kind of, how does that tie in with uh, kind of transitioning from doing a lot of documentary films to doing a lot of documentary TV, or at least this is your second docu-series at this point. Um, how do the two compare for you, for you both? And uh, do you enjoy one more than the other now? Like, obviously, you know, it, it works both ways. You're able to do, you're able to tell stories very, very well in either medium at either length. But what are some of the, I guess, advantages of, of working in television right now? Well, I mean, I think if we were doing Hoop Dreams now, it would be a, a docuseries. Uh, I don't think anyone would be interested in releasing a three hour documentary very, very easily. I mean, it happens. Fred Wiseman's new film is longer than three hours. But, you know, at, my guess is it would have been longer than three hours too. Um, we, 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 Hoop Dreams would have been a four or five hour miniseries or something is my guess, knowing me. Um, so I feel like I've been making docu-series, but just cramming them all into one film for a while now. And, and, um, and now um, the, the, you know, I've met my, uh, I've met my moment where, where people want that kind of length, but just in more bite-sized uh, pieces, I guess. And so I've always loved working long and some people would say I've worked too long, <laughs> but I've mm -hmm. always liked working long. And so to me, I don't see this as that different. I mean, I, I actually, yes, there are, there are different creative aspects to this versus a standalone film and America to me versus standalone. But in both cases, I kind of view them both as just really long films that where we, at the end of episodes, try to find provocative ways to end them mm -hmm. uh, so that you'll keep coming back, but not cliffhangers, not the usual, you know, um, things that you do in episodic docu-series, especially crime stuff. Uh, so I feel like these are long films. And, and that's why I think, that's why I'm so excited about the fact that um, they're showing it to, uh, tonight very yeah. soon uh, in um, uninterrupted the entire thing. I don't expect everybody to stick around for that, but for people who, you know, the, the proud, the brave, the few, mm. you know. <laughs> It's there, right? It's there. Um, right. They've got the option. Um, no, and I, I think that's great. And I also think it's it's been very exciting to kind of watch how you have adapted to an episodic structure, not in the way that you talked about, like not in the way of like the true crime stuff, but in the way of of finding standalone hours and when and where you cut mm. them so that it still functions, you know, essentially as episodic TV, even though the story just keeps going in such a natural way that, yeah, it's very easy to just keep watching. So I'll, I'm, I will never know the numbers, but I will be very, I'd be very curious to see how many people like stick all the way through instead of breaking it up day by day. So. And I, I just would add, you know, and, and stop me if we've already said this, but originally this was, we set out and we approached this in the field as though it was a film, you know, and, and it wasn't until we sat down and, and all the scenes were cut and it was a 12 hour long assembly <laughs> that it was really like okay is this a film or is this a series and i think you know obviously the answer is a series thank god <laughs> which is which is what yeah, yeah exactly it's it's uh it's it enables steve's uh tendencies uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, all right well another anonymous question uh is is kind of simply put just uh why do you feel you were the right people to tell this story um and i feel like you know obviously good context around that is knowing you know your history with the city is very important um but also like you know choosing the voices that you highlight within the show uh how does that kind of contribute to uh, your, you know, security and knowledge of knowing, like, yes, I, I can go in and tell this story and get it right and have a good perspective. And, and you know, this is this is a story that's good for me to, to go after. Yeah, well, and I think in this particular moment that that question is is a vitally important question. And maybe the, the questioner is, is wanting to get at that, too. This notion of well, two white guys sitting here telling a story that that ventures into uh, other communities quite significantly through the course of the five and a half hours. Mm -hmm. um, we did have a diverse team in the field. Uh, it wasn't as diverse as it could have been and probably should have been, to be perfectly honest. It just evolved that way because when it went from being a film to a series and the, the budgetary considerations that came with that. But, um, you know, both of us have been here for a long time. 
Um, both of us have been involved in films here um, in the city for a long time. And so I think we do feel like we have a level of comfort in, in the neighborhoods. Um, and one of the things that's changed for me um, in recent years, besides feeling a much stronger need to to diversify teams and to and to um, to work more collabor collaborative collaboratively in that way, is a realization that um, it's vitally important for us as white filmmakers to make sure we are also dealing with white people in our stories, mm -hmm. and that's something that's. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say is much more strongly strongly represented in my work in recent years than it was in earlier years. Um, we are we feel a, an obligation and a need to articulate white points of view, and 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 when we can set them in contrast to the points of view from of other people and other communities. That's yeah, that's a great answer. Um, and I, again, like I, I do think that that's kind of the nature of the question. So I'm glad you were able to kind of address that. Um, I know we're running a little bit out of time right now, but I want to squeeze in the last question that I think we've got on here from another anonymous, anonymous attendee. Um, not to put you on the spot, and I know we talked about this a little bit earlier, but who are your favorite quote unquote characters that you discovered while making this series? Like, is there somebody who you just can't stop thinking about or that just kind of emerged as a, as a favorite in your mind uh, now that you're all all done and it's about to be seen by the world. You want to go first on that one? Um, I always love uh, Phil Bradley. Um, from the moment we we hadn't even introduced ourselves to him, but we we kind of popped in his office. He was on the phone and we were filming him on this phone call and it's like, you know, hysterical. And he's such a, a but he's a really thoughtful, you know, smart guy, but he's very funny. Um, I think Amara, uh, Neil, um, well, don't say them all. Leave a few for me. <laughs> okay, sorry. You say some then, Steve. I mean, there's so many, though. There's so many. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, there are. I mean, I, I think the series is full of characters in the, in that way. Um, and and those, those three that he's mentioned absolutely are right up there. I think also up there for me is Ricky Hendon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Ricky, Ricky is sort of the embodiment of Chicago politics and the way it's played in this town. And he's just, you know, he's a total original. I mean, his nickname is Hollywood, Ricky right. Hollywood Hendon. <laughs> and I think he lives up to that. Uh, and then of course, Neil, in a, in a, in a, he's kind of like the anti-Ricky, right? There's the anti-Ricky, which is Neil Salas Griffin, because Neil is this guy who is so committed to doing right by his city and doing it in the right way um, and it's, you know, it, I'm not that Ricky isn't, but, but Neil is just, he's in a whole different headspace. He doesn't and, have any edges, you know? Yeah, yeah. 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 He, he wins you over. Ricky bowls you over. <laughs> <laughs> I really and will they, never And then they have this great relationship too, you know, and yeah. you can see it and it's, yeah. it's fantastic. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I will never understand exactly how Neil maintains such a, a positive and energetic outlook at all times, but that was one of the more uh, enamoring <laughs> aspects of the doc. Like just every time you saw him, I was like, God, this guy just he doesn't get tired. Like he's just, <laughs> yeah. um, well, thank you so much for, for coming today. Thanks to everybody who attended. Uh, remember City So Real premieres tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central on Nat Geo. It will also be available to watch in full tomorrow on Hulu. Um, so watch it. Uh, however you please, uh, but make sure you do. And again, thank you to both for, for joining me. Uh, it's been great. Thank you, Ben.